And welcome to the Team GB podcast, the moments that made me in association with the University of Hull. It's officially our fifth podcast, and that means that if you've listened to one, two, three, and four so far, you are a regular listener, and if so, welcome back. But if it's your first time joining us, it's great to have you on board, and if you're somewhere in between, that's okay by me. Now, every episode, we speak to truly fascinating GB Olympians or Olympic hopefuls to find out about the three moments that have ultimately made them the people and indeed the athletes that they are today. Thank you, by the way, to all of you that have commented online or left feedback. It's so, so cool to actually hear from the people that listen to this podcast series that I'm very excited about. And by the way, if you do like the show, please rate, review and subscribe. It helps us massively do that wherever you get your podcast from. So as I say, this is episode five. So you may have already heard from Becky and Ellie Downey, Becky Adlington, Pete Reed, Ed Clancy. But today's guest is Maddie Hinch, the penalty shootout hero of 2016, the three times hockey goalkeeper of the year. Now, Maddie really focuses on her moments from the early part of her career. The first time she put on her pads, her first big selection disappointment, and ultimately her GB debut, which began an incredible career leading to that Olympic gold in Rio. What I was really taken with is Maddie's brain and her approach to performance. It really is something that I've learned from, so I hope you all gain from it too. Enjoy. Well, I'm genuinely delighted to be joined by the European champion and the reigning Rio 2016 hockey gold medalist, Maddie Hinch. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very, very well. How's lockdown treating you? Yeah, do you know what? I'm, I'm actually quite enjoying it. Train, crack on with things, you know, get involved with housework, walk my dog more often than not. Um, yeah, I'm just really appreciating having that time. I think that's, that's what I'm enjoying the most. Have you had a chance to kind of reflect on your career? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, if, I, I always say to people, if you were to ask me where I'd be now, I would, I would not believe them. Like, it has gone above and beyond anything I ever imagined. Um, it's certainly not over yet. I've still got a little bit left in the tank. Um, but it's been a hell of a journey, really, like a real roller coaster ride. So uh, very grateful to have those experiences, that's for sure. Well, we're going to parenthesize that roller coaster ride into five succinct questions to find out how well you know Maddie Hinch. <laughs> Are you up for it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's go. <laughs> okay, I think you're going to do all right. Question number one How many international caps for both Great Britain and England do you currently have? Do you know what? I definitely know the answer to this because I really hope I get one more. So it's 149. Um, and really hoping we can get out of this lockdown so I can try and go get my 150. <laughs> Question number two, so one of one so far. What year did you make your England debut? England debut is 2008. Bang on, yes. It's, this is a very sports specific one, so I hope you're up to date on your strength and conditioning. How many Instagram followers do you have to the nearest 100? 50,000 point, oh God. Seven. Oh, you know what? You know what? I'm gonna give it is point eight. But is it? Nearest uh, hundred. You're within a hundred. You're within a hundred. That's fine. Yeah. Um, question four. How many penalties did you save in the Rio final? Okay, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, four. Yeah, four. Correct. And finally, do you remember how many goals you conceded throughout Rio 2016? Oh my goodness! You throw a spanner in there. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um. If I had to guess, I would say seven or eight. If you had to pull the trigger on one, what would it be? Seven. Eight. Oh, it's, <laughs> it was like the 50.7 or the 50.8. Oh, damn it. Okay, eight. I obviously forgot that number eight. <laughs> Out of interest, do you ever look back? Do you look back more at the things you've done really well at or things that perhaps haven't quite gone your way? Um, more often than not, I look back at the, the goals to be honest, um, and the bits that go wrong. I think the thing with Rio, I haven't, it's just such a like a positive memory. The part of me doesn't really want to see what went wrong. Um, so I haven't really looked back into that in detail because obviously the final just dominated uh, that memory so much. But in normal day to day for me, I, I absolutely, I reflect more on the things that go wrong. Because uh, for me, when it goes wrong, you have a chance to learn a little bit more. So that's why I do it. 
the reason I'm really fascinated to talk to you is to find out about the moments that have made you who you are and have got you where you've got to. Yeah. And so with that in mind, what's your very first moment that you feel made Maddie Hinch? Um, okay, so for me, I think I remember so vividly the day that I got put in the pads. And I say put in the pads because it was very much kind of a force for uh, encouragement from my new school. I'd actually joined the school in the summer term, so I was really the new kid. Um, and obviously hockey popped up and it was like, oh, Maddie, um, you were really great in rounders. We reckon you'll suit the role of a goalkeeper perfectly. I reckon, I still think it was purely because I was the new kid and back then no one wanted to be the goalie. Um, so it was like, oh, you can do it. Anyways, so I handed this ginormous bag that did not smell great at all. And I'm <laughs> putting on all this kit um, and I'm like waddling out the changer. And I just remember like, oh, my schoolmates like starting to laugh at me and be like oh you got that funny position and I was like oh great <laughs> so then waddling out to the pitch and bearing in mind I used to be like a little footballer and I was like in the midfield and I I wanted to be like in the thick of the action so for me this seemed like way so far away from what I normally like anyways I agreed to give it a go and um yeah I haven't looked, but looked back I just I just found it like just such a unique position and I think what I've really enjoyed is how you can have such a major role either way so it's kind of that life on the edge position that I enjoy so much and you have to learn to enjoy it because it is brutal at times but you can literally one action like change the momentum of a game or um and I just don't think you can replicate that save big save moment in any other position and I think it's that that I grew to love so I just yeah from the day I put the pads on I think it just felt like a second skin to me and that's why that first memory um sticks with me so well because obviously it's such an important one and I haven't obviously looked back since how do you feel now when you put pads on because I imagine if you're a boxer let's say you put gloves on there's yeah. an element of it might be different if it's an actual fight versus training but how do you actually feel because there's an element of it being quite gladiatorial in that you are Definitely. in the danger area it is actually high risk what you do but yet yeah. you're a part of a team and it's ultimately a game a part of me also is being honest I always say to people god I can't wait to retire and burn this bag like <laughs> it's like, like maybe not the retiring bit but the burning bag bit is definitely true um so it's just it is an annoying amount of kit but like I said before, it's such a unique position. And I think it's, it is odd. It is a bit of an odd position. I think people always say the goal has got to be a little bit odd. Am I a little bit odd? I think I like to do things a little bit differently. And I think that's what suits the role. And I think, you know, who chooses to stand and get balls smashed at them uh, for a living? Me. Um, so, you know, you've got to learn to enjoy. And I think every time I put my kit on, it's just another chance to kind of get that feeling that I kind of strive for every day. Those like big save moments. Um, and they are so rare that I still to this day, I don't know how many times I put the kit on. That'd be quite an interesting fact. We always talk about it as a goalie group. Do you reckon this is like our one million, millionth time? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, every time is great. And, and I, I enjoy it when I'm in the pads, but to say I rock up every day and look forward to that would be me lying. Like it's, it just doesn't exist. Like as an athlete, you always have times where you just like, you know, especially in the, the towards the end of your career when you have done it so many times. Um, but I love the position. I love playing. I've had times in my career when I've had to step back. I had a recent break um, yes. and I had to uh, kind of reassess why I was doing it because I, I got a bit tired and kind of lost my way. Um, and straight away after a bit of time off, you know, I just missed it. I missed that excitement. I missed the pressure. Um, and yeah, now putting my kit on every day is certainly uh, not a chore for me, that's for sure. That kind of brings us on to the second moment that made you, which is actually quite a difficult one. We'd been out in Germany. We were a few months away from the Junior World Cup, which is essentially the pinnacle of, a, uh, of your junior career. It's the one you want to play in and you almost feel you have to play in to then be considered for the seniors. Um, and we went over to Germany and we played a few test games and I had a shocking weekend, like really poor, like just did not play well at all out of nowhere. I felt like I was doing all right at the time, but it just so happened as everyone had a, a couple of bad days. Anyways, we get back to the UK and I get a phone call the next morning from my coach. Uh, and he's, he says, man, it's like, we're not going to carry on with you. We're not going to take you forward for the, for the rest of this year. Um, and, it, you know, you've seemed to have lost a bit of form at the worst time. And so now I need to make sure I've got a number two that I can rely on a little bit more. And it was literally as cutthroat as that. And I, and I it hits me so hard and it sticks with me so much as a memory because of how it is the reality of what we do. 
um, you know, the elite sport is a cutthroat world. The best make it. Uh, if you're not quite there, you don't. Um, and I think that moment in time for me was where I had to decide, okay, like how much do I want this? Um, it, you know, I'd, I was basically left in that gray area of, okay, I'm now out of the 21s um, and I'm not invited to the seniors. I wasn't given a contract after that. Uh, I was just at Loughborough training, playing club. Like, okay, so am I ever going to be a senior international athlete? Right. That's why it stuck with me so much because I decided, okay, right, I, I still feel I can offer something to this game and I still feel like I can grow as a keeper. I just need to be in the mix for longer. Uh, so I chose to move to Leicester and get myself in the mix with uh, some of the current internationals at that time. And, and of course, people talk. So I was playing well for them. And, and the girls were saying to Danny down at Bisham, you need to have a look at our youngster in goal. She was playing well. And, and before I knew it, I had a call. And that's kind of how, like for me, my career has been. It's dropped, but kept knocking, dropped, but kept knocking. Um, and yeah, I'm so glad I didn't just like give up, essentially. So when you got that call, do you remember where you were? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was in Somerset at my, my parents' home. I was in my bedroom. I literally can remember that I was, I can remember the call. I can remember how I was. I was sat in my bed and it just caught me so off guard. So yeah, I remember where I was. I was absolutely distraught. My my family have always been there when, when those phone calls have come in. Um, and yeah, just cried my eyes out and was basically to my mom, like, am I ever going to make it? Like, is this how it's always going to go? um and yeah it's it like it's it's not a particularly nice memory but a, a really important one i think and i think when it gets tough it's always a good one to reflect on and what is it about you that perseveres on because the reason i was kind of pressing where you were what your situation is i think a lot of the time when it comes to especially athletes yeah. we hear about the hard times but they generally get glossed over and you know that it all comes good in the end and we know it all comes good in the end for you because of rio but at that point there, when you're feeling desperate, when you're think your hand, your life's in the hands of other people, you can't control mm -hmm. that. You can't make the selector's decision for them. Did you consider quitting? And what is it about you that thought, no, I'm going to see this through? I guess I'm just really stubborn. I think I'm, <laughs> I'm that. I am a stubborn person. And I think, I, think, I think what's really important, and I guess for any athlete that kind of really makes it to the top, is that element of self-belief. And I guess despite the amount of kind of spanners that were thrown at me along my journey, I always had this like, and it's not an arrogance, but it's a belief that I could achieve and that I was capable of doing that. And I had something to offer. And I, and I guess I never really doubted my abilities despite what everyone was telling me or, you know, you're too inconsistent and you're too short, you're too small. I had all that from the beginning. You're never going to make it because you're not the, tall enough and big enough and all this. Um, it, for me, that didn't matter because I always had this like inner drive that I was meant to do this. And I kind of felt that the hockey pitch was where I belonged. It sound, as cheesy as that sounds, that's literally how I felt. So it didn't matter what people kept saying to me or, or kept doing to try and throw me off my path. I was always going to be, hello, like pay attention to me. I just need you to see what I have to offer. Um, and that's why I knew like, okay, right. If I change what I'm doing here and get myself kind of noticed again, then you never know Like if I can get the head coach to, to see what I offer. He might like my style of goalkeeper. He might see some potential in me going forward and, and then I can learn. Because again, it's about getting a good goalkeeper coach you know, on board and, and someone who sees your strengths. So he sees that I'm dynamic, sees that I'm quick. Yes, that causes me to be a bit up and down, but how do we get Maddie to now like balance that out really? And, and I just needed to get in the mix at Bisham and be you know around the best coaches in the world uh, to find a... To, actually find my true potential and yeah so I guess the stubbornness of the more you kind of knock me down the stronger I got really and I again and like I say if I hadn't had that career or I just kept getting picked and it was all a bit easy would I be here now like with the career I've had no I don't think I would have because it's just made me way more resilient so yes I don't necessarily have the drops up and down at the minute touch wood but it's still tough out there like you still have so many knocks in so many different ways and that I have got, I reckon, a lot of resilience from, from my junior kind of experiences really growing up. And it was as a result of that tenacity that the next moment that makes you comes in. 
I was on trial. I finally got kind of uh, noticed uh, at, uh, at Leicester, and, and I remember the phone call. Maddie, um, Danny wants you to come down to Bisham for some trials and, and, and see what you're about. And I was like, okay, great. Like, right, I'm in. So um, I was on trial for about six months, and what I was trying to do was get myself a contract. Um, bearing in mind there was currently five goalies down there on contracts, like a lot. Yeah. Wow. Oh. So it was a bit of a tough ask, and. Did I truly believe I could get one? I don't know. But for me, okay, I'm in the mix. I've got another chance to kind of get my name out there. Um, and yeah, trialing for six months, I was trialing really well, playing really well, um, like a little bit fearless, I guess, probably because I felt it was maybe too soon or I was too young looking at the other goalies. Like the number one was 11 years older than me. She'd been to Beijing. Like it almost felt like too far. So I was probably playing with a really relaxed, not too much pressure. And anyways, I remember it. we were at Bisham and um, we were playing Germany in a test series, a team full of stars that I'd watched at the Beijing games. Um, and uh, I was kind of just sat in the meeting room thinking like that when they announced the team that I was just going to be on the side watching again. No worries. But like the team came up on the, on the board and my name was on the, the top. And I was like, eh? Like, that must be a typo like that can't be right anyways it was and it was like Danny got me up it's like Maddie this will be your Great Britain debut um all the best you've been training well just go out there and keep doing what you're doing and I was like like I don't particularly remember that the the feelings I had at that moment I don't remember being scared or like feeling I wasn't ready I, if anything that kind of that's probably why because I was so relaxed and um yeah, we went in, played played Germany. I was massively under the pump. Like we were, yeah, they were peppering our goal. So I was busy. And in some ways that suits you. I think as a keeper, sometimes if you get a couple of early saves and you can really get in the flow of the game. And I guess like the Germans being on top for that first half helped and I was playing well. Um, I actually saw the clips for that, that game just the other day when we were putting a webinar together. And my goodness, it still made me smile. Um, and yeah, we ended up winning the game 3-2. Um, I had a huge role to play uh, and uh, it wasn't too long after that, that 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 game earned me a contract but I remember the moment I drove out of Bisham Abbey I can see it now I'm driving out of Bisham Abbey the gate the bars going up and I was just smiling so much because I think I knew that one I'd proved to myself that I could compete at this level that was that was a huge tick but I knew I'd proven to everyone else around me that I'm ready to be taken seriously and that for me was yeah the moment that I knew I really belonged here and that this was kind of what I was going to do and I knew I'd done enough to get a contract and yeah it wasn't too long after that that I that I did and and yeah that was that's why that's such a big memory for me. In terms of the selection for 2012 that's presumably the dream a home Olympics. Yes. But it, it doesn't quite happen for you why was that? Yeah. Um, so when I got, as I said to you before, with the five goalkeepers when we came in, so I came in as number six. So now I'm number six in 2010, not too long away from London. So right. years, nothing really. Um, and certainly not a lot of time as a goalkeeper to gain experience. But before I knew it, it was 2000. Yeah, we're in 2012 and I'm now like third. I'm, there's, I'm like literally within the top three. Um, and so it was, I had a shot. So again playing well kind of growing all the time really kind of finding my feet on the international stage but very inexperienced as a keeper very inexperienced still very raw um and again it's hard to get pitch time so you know they're preparing their number one to go play at that games they're trying to work out their number two there's so many of us everyone's trying to get pitch time so i had about four or five caps in total at this point um but i was in the mix and i knew i was playing well and i felt like i was playing well enough to to earn that reserve, uh, the second spot under Beth. Um, there was a good chance that Beth was going to step aside afterwards and there was a good chance that I was going to come in after and be the number one. So for me, it felt like just fitting that that was how it was going to go. But I was, again, just so naive because at the end of the day, if I had been the number two and Beth had got injured, like thankfully that didn't happen but if she'd got injured or, or for whatever reason couldn't play and it was me stepping in was I ready no I was not my goodness oh, okay. so, so in, I didn't get the nod I ended up being the third choice I, the email that came through that morning again it was very similar to that world cup experience that just pure devastation like I thought I had it um, I thought I'd done enough to have it everyone kept saying I was playing well I'm doing well I hadn't really had any negative feedback so for me it just felt like oh well okay well then surely that will earn me some reward. 
But it, again, it's elite sports, not like that. There's just more to it. And at the time I couldn't see that. I was again, why, like why I've done everything. I've ticked every box. You're telling me I'm stopping the ball. I am stopping the ball. So why, why am I not there? Um, but now as a more experienced athlete and looking back, I totally get it. Like I was, it would have been way too much. Like that was a hell of an event. Like the crowds were ginormous. I was in, in the crowd for every game. And I remember looking around thinking, could I have handled this at 24 years old with four caps in my name? No, I couldn't. And them not picking me was, the, again, a, a tough move for them. I know how hard it is when they drop athletes, but completely the right one. Um, because throwing someone in too early and too soon can, can really like hinder an athlete's future career. And again, it was another kind of setback that made me want it more. Um, so yeah, immediately after that, the number one shirt all of a sudden became available for the first time in a long time. And I was like, right, there's no way anyone else is getting this. Does it make it difficult for yourself having your performance assessed partly on the performance of other people? If there's a defensive error that mm. could result in a goal, but ultimately on your record, it says you conceded a goal. Yeah. Yeah, it's goalkeeping, isn't it? It's tough. Um, I think every goalkeeper will take any goal personally and think they should have stopped it. I certainly do. But you have to, if you do that too much, it will only like grind away at you. So it's always trying to remember that you are part of a team. And, and sometimes when I don't touch the ball, I can be like, oh, that, well, I didn't actually contribute to that game. But people are quickly reminding, you know, maybe you actually helped organise the defence so much that that the ball didn't get to you. Because ideally, if a goalie just stands there doing nothing, then your team's doing pretty well, probably. If your goalie's getting peppered, then we need to talk <laughs> about what's going on. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is a massive team effort. You can't have a great goalkeeper without a great team, I don't feel. Like, you literally can't do it on your own. You, you gotta, your back line needs to know every sort of action that I'm likely to make at any sort of given time so that you work together to make those kind of shots at angles that are only going to help me. People know what sort of um, language I need to use at certain moments uh, to, to get the best out of that situation. Like there's so much detail that I think people from the outside can't see and you can just see goal. Um, but in the moment, if, unless you see it through our eyes and maybe what happened in the build-up, um, then you can understand it a little bit more. It's like when someone, it's like when a goalkeeper gets megged, everyone's like, oh, like, <laughs> what are you doing? It's like, do you know how hard it is to, to stop a shot straight down the middle? It's really hard. Um, so yeah, I think it's, that's the real life of a goalkeeper, isn't it? It's brutal. But for every one of those moments, when the day you make a save that like literally wins a game or changes the momentum of a game, then yeah, it's worth all the, all the rubbish stuff. That's for sure. If I'm playing in defense and you're in goal, I'm hearing you now and you're measured, you're calm, you're relaxed, you're affable, you're pleasant. What would you be like if I was playing defense and perhaps I wasn't performing as you would have liked? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, God, if any of my teammates listen to this, I'm like, no, you're not like that. Like, I'm quite harsh, I think. I'm quite tough. I'm quite, I, and I think that's come with experience. I think as a younger keeper, I probably was like pretty quiet. Um, you know, my difference now in comparison to like Rio, uh, the role I have is very different. Like, my back line in front of me was Krista Cullen, Kate Walsh, like the amount of caps they had. Right. Me, I just saw it as, yeah, I, I would organise them and I'd tell them where attackers were and, and I'd give that sort of instruction. I'd set things up, but I don't think, I, I just trusted that they kind of knew what they were doing. Whereas now, like, I've got a very young line, back line in front of me. So my role is kind of very different. Um, but I think if, a, and that's what I've had to learn, I guess, is, is also to, I can't just be like, what the hell was that? Like, what are you doing? Like, it's all part of the learning and it's that fine balance between an athlete recognising that that's just not good enough to they need to now instead of me just braiding them learn something from that and I think that's right. just a role you come into as a leader that you know you, you, you're teaching them what you know um, and you're only trying to help them get better because if they get better I get better that's essentially it and we all get better as a team um, so yeah I'm, I'm tough and in the, I am fiery definitely a fiery person um, and I think you know I used to, they used to do the, uh, the thing called the Maddie Paddy that was uh, <laughs> a pretty well-known uh, thing. 
Um, you know, God, I used to break sticks and stuff on posts. Like, I was a right nightmare. Like, any goal, it doesn't matter if they smash it in the top corner. I was like, can't show any sense of weakness really to the opposition like we've we've got on top of her or we're in her head or whatever it's like i've got it i've got to give off a sense of calmness to the guys like you know what guys they've scored yeah it's okay we'll regroup but at the same time you've got a part of me inside that's like god i'm, I'm so furious that they've scored but like that's calm it so i had my processes i had my go behind the goal pick up my water bottle drink and as i throw that down that's me throwing it away as a step back over the line that's me resetting and joining back in with the girls and the team so these are the things you sort of learn uh, to manage that and to, uh, to to make sure that you are in the right sort of headspace and, and consistently throughout a game, what, no matter what that game is throwing at you. I've been in eight nil losses quite recently and it's just, it just is what it is. Like sometimes it just doesn't go okay. well and, and yeah, and sometimes it does. When you talk about moments that make you, I think it's safe to say that winning an Olympic gold medal would be one of them. Yeah. But I'd love to find out what we don't know about that experience and what we don't know about what it took to get there. Because I think certain things are, qu are quite well documented, but I'm sure you sit there and think, yeah. if only people knew about this, they don't know anything. I think, I think a lot of people still don't really understand the journey. I've, I've dipped into it a little bit at the time, but that medal, that gold medal reflected just so much more than that that two, three weeks that we were there. It was literally part of, and for me, it was part of a much shorter experience than my, my captain Kate and Helen and those guys that had, you know, not qualified for games in the past. Um, they look at that medal and they see the heartbreak in those moments. Then they look at that medal, they see the European goal just the, just the year before, like those real key parts of their career. They look at that gold medal and they see the sessions where we're crying because we're so tired and coaches are shouting at us and we're having to, like run off to the side and, and people can't, you know, people are ill from how hard they're being pushed, like those real dark days. That's what that medal reflects. Um, and I think that, I think people didn't quite realise that it was just two years before then that we were at the bottom of a World Cup. Like how does that team wow. two years later win a European goals and an Olympic goals? Like that's the journey. That's the, that's the unknown side. I think that it almost the gold medal overshadows a little bit the the real dark moments and, and like i said if we hadn't gone through that experience at the world cup would we have won gold mm, i don't know i think that made us i think it made us reassess it made us have those incredibly difficult conversations with each other it made us be honest to one another and 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 like say guys we got we gotta we gotta get on things sorted here like if we don't we're gonna find ourselves constantly in fifth sixth places like who who wants to do this every day and and have that as, as our lives like we are striving for gold we're saying we do it so how are we getting there um and i think it is that that journey that i think people forget um and it was a reflection of i guess how much of a team we were so for example were we the best hockey team there? Were we the best hockey players? No. Were we the best hockey team as a team as a whole? 100%. It did not, and that's what that final showed. It did not matter what they kept throwing at us and they threw an awful lot at us. We just got stronger and tighter as a unit. As they got, as that game got harder and for the Dutchies, then, yeah, it's Dutchies, the Dutch, um, they started getting a little bit more individual. They just didn't know how to come together and really kind of dig deep. Whereas we were like, right, find a way to win, find a way to win. That was from our training every single day at Bisham. Like the, the more they throw at us, the tighter we get. Everyone knew what sort of action each player needed. Everyone knew in the moment, if you look in their eyes, okay, this is what that person needs from me. This was the detail that we went into at Bisham. We talked about if I'm on a bad day, this is what you can say to help. If I'm on a good day, this is what you can say to help. So that every single person had to, a way to contribute no matter what day they were on. And I think that's what a lot of people kind of miss. It was such a team effort. It's very easy for them to say, oh, for example, me, oh, you saved so many goals. It was that you were a big part of that, that performance. Okay, maybe, but at the same time, every single person on that pitch had a role to play and did something that contributed to that final result. And that was because it didn't matter if you came out on a bad day and you were like, oh God, I'm not playing too well here. You knew that, okay, that's, that's the situation, but this is how I still make an impact. Um, and uh, I guess that's like that behind the scenes work is, is what I don't think people, a lot of people know about and the detail we went into and, and how much we, we looked at that stuff probably more than any other team there. And that's what, that's what paid off for us. We, we went into more detail than anyone else. You know, and you're stood there and it's penalties and 
I mentioned the word binary before. It's either goal or it's save. Yeah. You, you are recognised as being, as a bare minimum, a crucial and integral part of that victory. But not at that point. You could be if it goes really well. You also mentioned about the processes that you go through. Yeah. What's actually going through your head when that first penalty was about to be taken? And has it even begun then or is it actually as the player approaches the ball or as you get yourself into position? Yeah, again, this is the detail, I think, that I wonder whether any other team went into. it. Maybe they did, but we were so ready from that moment. So as soon as the whistle went, it was like everyone knew their process. So for me, I knew that I was going to go get my bottle. People knew what to say to me in that moment. We talked about that. I don't want to hear this. I do want to hear this. I don't want to arm around the thing. Like literally this sort of detail. So everyone could stay in their processes. Um, we talked about as a shootout group what we want. Does anyone want to say anything to me if, if, they, if they score or they don't score? Same with the girls. Do you want to, as you're walking up, do you want us to say, go on, go on, Alex. You want to hear that? Like this is the detail we went into. We went into how long should we take to walk? <laughs> to the how long should I take to walk to the goal like how long do I want them to wait the opposition same for the guys taking the penalties we want the goalie to be in the goal and we want to take our time like this is you're in control of that moment so make it what it suits you and is going to give you the best chance of scoring or for me saving the ball um you know little things like the guys on the ball about to take the penalty do you look at the goalkeeper do you not do you tap it do you not like because sometimes I remember like I think it was Soph would say if I tapped it and then I like mistapped it, I was like, oh God, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess it up because I'm nervous. So, so she chose, actually, that's not for me. Whereas Helen was like, right, I go up, play with the ball a little bit. That gives me a little bit of a swagger. And now I feel good. That helps. So for her, that was her process. Um, so the answer to your question is we knew it in so much detail, like detail that probably people didn't even realise. It was very easy to see me in a notebook and think that was kind of yeah. it. But I, yeah, my, the moment the whistle went, my walk to the goal, to change my stick, I get a different stick for shootouts, change my stick, the, the walk back to the girls. I didn't join the huddle bit as, as a whole team as they were announcing who was taking the shootouts. I kind of kept myself to myself and, and I was chilled. I don't know what it was. I think the game, the, it'd been a good game. Like I'd been really involved. So I felt really in the match. Whereas I think the Dutch goalkeeper hadn't had that many touches of the ball. So she probably didn't felt quite so in it. However, she did very well in the shootout as well. But for me, I, I'd done, we'd done so many. I'd done it so many times at Bisham that it was a bit like, I'm ready. Like, I'd done, I, there was no more boxes I could have ticked at that moment. Same for the guys taking them. We'd done everything we could have done to give ourselves the best chance to win that shootout. So there was no fear. That's the difference. Whereas if you go into something a little bit unprepared, you're a bit, oh, could I have done a bit more work there? And I remember thinking to myself, I can't remember what it was, but could you imagine if the Olympic final went to a shootout and I just hadn't done my homework? Like, whoa, that would be that would be hard to handle. And there we were, like in the Olympic final. So I'd done so much homework on the on the opposition. I knew who was going to take it. I knew what they were going to do. I don't particularly remember anything that I was thinking. I've seen footage of me. I looked quite relaxed. I probably felt relaxed, and I just felt ready. And that's a really nice headspace to be in as an athlete. If you just think, do you know what? I'm as prepared as I can be. Let's just give it a go. Like if we'd lost it, we'd have lost it. Would I have had any regrets? Absolutely not, because it was certainly not through lack of preparation. What's going to be really interesting is Tokyo's all changed. You came into Rio and you were not expected to win. I think it's safe to say. Yeah. Now you're the defending Olympic champions, yeah. but a lot has changed for the team. Yeah. So does that mean a different approach for the entire team, and I, and I guess a different role for yourself in terms of experience level now? Yeah, this, this is the challenge. Like, I remember Danny basically said it to us the next day and we were like, oh, God, Danny, like, can we have like 24 hours to enjoy this? He was like, guys, it's now winning after winning. And he's right. Like, that is a real tough place to be. Like, it's quite, it's not easy, but it's a little bit easier to certainly be like quietly getting on behind, like no one really paying attention because you don't think they're going to win or, um, and that's kind of where we were at. We were, what, sixth, seventh in the world at the time. We, um, we had done too great in the tournament just beforehand but that kind of allowed us to quietly get on with our business without much attention which probably helped now you go in as reigning olympic champions you basically have a target on your back everyone wants to beat you whether even we're playing at the olympics or at a test match the difference now is already noticeable like if you're the olympic champions people want to beat you more than ever um and this is the sort of discussion we've had to have as a team because we've got a lot of youngsters who are coming in you know with that already on their shoulders and that's tough because they've not had the processes to be 
understanding that yet but at the same time they are part of that now so we've had to work out as a group how we enjoy i guess that that uh, unbelievable title that we get to carry at, the, at this moment in time like olympic champions like, people would give their arm to say that for a day like i'm a current olympic champion or i'm part of the olympic, current olympic champion team you cannot not enjoy having that and i, and I guess at the, the very beginning i think post rio we probably handled that wrong i'd say i think we i certainly did as an athlete i i felt i had to relive that that tournament all over again and, and produce that final performance every single time I played. And I'd right. kind of gone out of my, like my little space that I'm normally in where it's kind of just me and the ball, like that's it. And instead I was like, I've got to stop the ball because so that's how people now deem it to be. And, and there was uh. a lot more eyes on it. It's the same from a team perspective. Like if we didn't win, there was a lot more people with an opinion about it. Um, and I think, as a group, we definitely will admit we've not handled it well at the beginning, but I think it's those conversations as senior athletes to junior athletes that it's like, guys, we have to enjoy that we have this privilege to, to be this, the current Olympic champions right now and, and part of that squad and, and enjoy the fact that people are challenging us just more than ever. You know, put that into the way we play, put that into the way we carry ourselves. Like, like, like put your shoulders back. Yeah, we are. So you, we're going to be hard to beat and we'll show you why. And, uh, and it, it takes a bit of time to get there, definitely. Um, and I think that's how we have to approach Tokyo. We can't go in with a fear that like, everyone wants to beat us. Great. Like, let's, let's, let's accept that challenge and see how we get on. And, and, and yeah, what will be will be. It is a different approach. Uh, it is probably tougher. But again, it, be grateful for the fact that we have that and we could go and get it again and, and be excited at that possib possibility. What's really nice is when you were talking about Rio, I yeah. mentioned that you weren't describing the emotion, you were describing the process. Yeah. Whereas when you're talking about Tokyo, your eyes light up. You're actually excited yeah. by the prospect to get back at it again. 100%. Like, why would, oh gosh, competing in the Olympic Games alone without even the medals is just so special. To be an Olympian and part of Team GB is just something that you, you, you never take for granted. So for me, like, it's always, I guess it goes back to me as a bit of a process person. It is a process. For me right now, I want to I wanna get selected um, and I want to play well. Like, I want to individually know that I've done everything I can to be best prepared to be there and, and contribute to that team's performance. Um, and then it's almost like it's almost like the goal, of course, is to defend our title and come home with, a, with another gold medal. Absolutely. It's one game at a time. Like, each game is, is, is part of the process. We tap that game, then we, then we part that, learn from it, next one. Rather than thinking already about the final, thinking about potential yes. not being in a it, you can lose your way in your focus. It's one game at a time, and that was exactly the process that we had for Rio, and it was a, a great process to have. So that's the process we're now trying to implement into this group. Um, and so for me, it's the same as an individual athlete. Want to get selected, want to play well, want to contribute, want to win the first game, get you know, you know things like that. So uh yeah it's kind of there i'm excited um I, but it, and now it's so far away it feels so far away so i'm having yeah. to start back and be like okay the process we've got to start again what's the journey now between now and tokyo and how do i make sure that i do arrive excited and, and ready what's lovely is i knew when i spoke to you i knew it would be amazing to find out about becoming an olympic champion but knowing that you took a while out of the sport i was curious to know what your attitude to it is now but yet you actually seem as enthused as you ever were yeah well that's 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 why i did the break like i if you'd spoken to me i guess post our home world cup i think it would have been a very different interview and um yeah. i would have probably come across a little bit tired and maybe fed up and and uh felt like i was carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders a little bit you know you, that's the, i guess the hard part is when you've had a taste of the like the ultimate you want it all the time yes. and you can't understand why we're not in a final every time and it's frustrating and I'm like why am I not always playing there and you kind of like I said you, you, your bubble gets bigger and bigger and the key as an athlete is to keep it as narrow as possible and, and with success comes more external factors that you have to kind of choose to say yes to or say no to or or to or to listen to like whose opinions really matter um and things like that and in my first couple of years post Rio I definitely didn't get it right um and I lost my way a little bit and with that I became unhappy and didn't enjoy playing anymore putting on the kit was becoming a chore like no one can play well if that's the sort of headspace you're in and I just knew I had to change something up 
Um, so I chose to step, step away, which is incredibly hard because then I'm handing the shirt for the first time. Right. Which I worked so hard to, to, to have my, be mine at that stage. But I wouldn't have had it much longer if I just decided to hang around. I, I'm almost certain of that. I was definitely on the, heading in the wrong direction. And having that time to step away from the team and, and from actually I'd moved to Holland. So I stepped away completely, like didn't want to hear about what was going on. Didn't really watch any of the, any of their games. Then made me, I guess, work out, like I said before, my why, like, why am I doing this? Why do I want to do this? What's my goal? Um, and what, it took me some time to get there, definitely. But I suddenly just missed it. Like I miss playing. You, when you love what you do and again it sounds quite cheesy and people hear it all the time but if you can remember that you're doing it because you love the game and you love the sport and that's why as a 13 year old kid I put the pads on and and have done ever since then um then you play with a smile on your face and and you can enjoy what you do and I think that's easier said than done so I've had to learn now those factors are still there and there's still the attention and there's still the pressure but how do I be aware of it but park it and and get myself back in a headspace that every day I can be like I love to play this game um and there's and that's why I'm here and that's why I'm going to training every day and that's why I get in the gym and horrible walk bike sessions because I love it and I want to be on the pitch as much as I can and, and that's why my final question I suppose would be about sacrifices because yep. making a decision to totally focus yourself on one endeavor mm -hmm. I imagine takes its toll on family friends relationships things yeah. of that nature it, yeah. is that something you feel that you, you've had to make i i really don't like the word sacrifice because i generally think it's just a choice that i've made um all the choices that i've made i don't regret any of them even the ones that I got wrong like in that moment I, I, you've got to trust what you believe is right um yes there are things i've missed out on for a long long time and the stuff that when i hang up the pads i look forward to be able to invest in time in but my goodness what we do for a living is just so i'm so lucky to do this for a living um and you've got it on the days where i'm like oh i quickly try and bring myself back to like how lucky i am and also how short a life this is like it, right. you don't get to do this for very long so yeah the choices to not be able to go to people's weddings or parties or have like long relationships it's, it's tough you're out the country so much um those choices they're nothing like to have to, to be able to say that and then have that gold medal like come on like that's worth every sacrifice or choice that you make um so yeah i've asked that been asked that question quite a few times and it's a choice and every choice that i make i i do it because i feel it's right um and uh yeah enjoy enjoy being fortunate enough to get to play the game i love for a living every single day um and then we'll work out afterwards what to do Maddie, I'm honestly genuinely blown away by you. Thank you so much for your time. The one thing I've taken away from this is not only you process driven, but if I really wanted to get into your head, I'd nick your water bottle and I think it might just get into there. Yeah, <laughs> it's a precious item. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been fun. And all the very best of luck in Tokyo, because if everyone is half as excited as you are in the team, then I think we've got destined for great things once again. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's going to be a great journey. We're looking forward to it. And once again, an Olympian has absolutely blown me away. Maddie has an unrelenting commitment. She doesn't even see sacrifice as such. But I suppose for me, it's her approach to process that impresses me most. And it's that approach that's resulted in Olympic heroism. It's, I suppose, a journey which nearly didn't even happen at all. And I'm sure it will not be the last feat of excellence that we see from her what an Olympian. Well, make sure you join us next week on the moments that made me in association with the University of Hull for another three moments. And this one, by the way, comes from a man who produced possibly the most heartbreaking interview I've ever heard in my entire life. He was one second away from gold in the Taekwondo in Rio 2016. His name is Latelo Mohammed. He is charismatic, he is enigmatic, and it's a story you won't want to miss. <laughs>